12 at this point. I think, Doug, if you are ready, um, we have Doug, who's going to talk about chasing awards, um, which would be an interesting presentation as well, and make a good follow-on to uh, our DX spotting presentation that Mike gives. So, uh, Doug, if you're ready, feel free to take it away. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, let me just first uh, kind of add a comment to Mike's presentation. Um, of course, when you're looking for a spot, you want a spot that uh, will lead you to a station that you can hear. So you want a station that's a lot like yours. Well, the station that is most like yours is your own. And where I see this coming uh, is uh, radios becoming more and more capable of spotting the stuff they can hear. Now, the, I guess the most prominent example of that today is if you work FT8, uh, you will get a report of all the stations that are in uh, about a 3K uh, FT8 watering hole if you run a, a program like JT Alert. Um, but you can also do things like this uh, with other modes. In the case of CW, there is a, a skimmer program that will take a feed from your radio. And if you have a radio that has a so-called IQ feed, which is uh, 256K wide, uh, it'll ingest the whole 256K and report everything it hears in the format of a cluster. So you can do all the, the cluster things with that. I found that really useful for the ARLDX uh, CW contest where you can only work DX stations. So the, the uh, uh, skimmer would report in cluster format the frequency and the call sign. And since you can Im immediately tell from the call sign who you could work and um, you know, the software on my radio will adjust the cluster stuff and give me one click to it. I could just click through the DX stations and ignore the US stations. Uh, there are skimmers available for CW and RIDI today. Uh, for sideband, well, that takes more computing than probably most of us have, but the pieces are all there. I mean, my wife is a little hard of hearing and she runs a program on her cell phone that does uh, uh, text to speech and it's pretty good. So someday I think there will be a uh, sideband skimmer. Okay, well enough on that. Let me go ahead and uh, get into the presentation on chasing awards. So let me um, let's see. Let me share my screen here. And there we go. Okay, is that coming across okay? Good. Yes. All right. So we'll talk about, well, what are the awards? What are, what are they like? Uh, some of the common ones that are available just a little bit on why chase them. And then what do I have to do to get one in terms of uh, both operating and then going through the mechanics of uh, ending up with the award. Um, let's see, I would um, also say that uh, necessarily I'll be talking about uh, keeping track of who you've worked and who you've gotten confirmed and the metrics associated with that that uh, are required for the awards. And I have friends who, you know, don't want to apply for the awards and get pieces of paper and so on, but they're still interested in the met metrics. So I'm hopeful that uh, even if you're not interested in the certificates, there may be some tidbits in what I have to say that uh, will be of some use to you. Okay, let's talk about uh, primarily the ARRL and uh, to a degree the CQ Magazine Awards. There are lots and lots of awards. Um, mostly they are, come as paper certificates or endorsement stickers, and I'll show you 
uh, what an endorsement sticker looks like in a moment. Uh, but sometimes plaques or trophies or that sort of thing for uh, the more unusual awards. Uh, for the ARL awards, you need to be an ARL member. Uh, with CQ Magazine, you don't have to be a subscriber, but the fees for getting the award are higher if you're not. Uh, and uh, if you um, look at, say, the Wikipedia article on ham radio awards, they say there are thousands of them. And I think that's probably true if you think of all the you know, summits on the air, parks on the air, special event stations, 13 colonies. I mean, the list just goes on and on. But here are some of the most popular. Um, the uh, Worked All States Award is an AARL award. And there are uh, some other providers of similar awards. If you uh, use EQSL uh, for um, uh, confirmations, they have uh, awards that are kind of parallel to the ARRL awards, uh, but you have to have EQSL confirmations to get them. Um, so worked all states for uh, the 50 states, and then there are various endorsements, and I'll talk about those in a second. And the other one we talk about a lot is the DX Century Club, which is for working 100 entities on the DXCC list. And sometimes people say countries, well, they're not really all countries. And DXCC was never intended to be about countries. Uh, what someone did was sit down and say, OK, let's take a look at geography and at political entities. And anything that's sovereign got on the list. Uh, now, with countries, um, many of the countries have more than one entity, and that's based on geography. So for the US, for example, Alaska and Hawaii are separate DXCC entities because they are physically discontinuous. Um, with, for Russia, you have Asiatic Russia and European Russia, and Kaliningrad is a little piece of Russia that is physically discontinuous, and all three of those count as separate entities. Um, also, uh, there are some interesting ones because anything that's sovereign is an entity. And the um, most interesting one that I come across was the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. And you would think that's in Malta, right? Well, uh, it used to be uh, until I think the 18th century when the French kicked them out. So now the Sovereign Military Order of Malta is two buildings in the city of Rome, Italy, uh, that have sovereign status like an, like, uh, an embassy would. Uh, and there was somebody on a de-expedition there last year that uh, some of us were able to work. Um, also, the UN headquarters in uh, New York City uh, has its own um, DXCC entity. And they were actually on the air, I think it was last week, that uh, I was able to work then for the first time. Uh, 4U1UN. Uh, now, some of us have worked 4U1WB and gotten excited. Gee, that must be something really good. Well, that's the World Bank in DC, and that one is not its own DXCC, it just counts as uh, any DC station would. Uh, so, right now, the list is about uh, 340. If you look at the DXCC numbers, there are a lot more than that, and that's because uh, political boundaries change. Uh, there used to be two Germanys, and now there's one. And uh, there used to be uh, Czechoslovakia that broke up. And so, you know, the entities change as uh, the political boundaries uh, change. So DXCC, uh, the base award is for working 100 entities, and we'll talk some more about some variants. Uh, CQ Magazine has a Worked All Zones Award. CQ has divided uh, the US into 40, or I'm sorry, the world into 40 zones. And uh, right now I have 39. The one that I'm missing is the one around Vietnam. So I don't have the Worked All Zones. 
I could apply for the work doll continents. That's a uh, IARU, International Amateur Radio Union Award, but you can apply for it through the ARRL. And uh, I could apply for that. I would have to paw through my uh, QSL cards because that's a paper application and paper card submission. Uh, for the uh, ARRL awards, uh, you can use either Logbook of the World or verified paper cards and you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, for the CQ Magazine Awards, you can have either of those two, or you can have uh, EQSL uh, confirmations to qualify for those. Okay, so let's look at some awards. Uh, here's what the Worked All States Awards uh, looks like. This is actually the old version of the certificate. They have a, a more modernized one now, but what I wanted to show you was you see on here the uh, gold stickers. And the way WAS works is that you get one paper certificate. And then if you get uh, uh, WAS on a single band or in a single mode, you can get these endorsement stickers to uh, paste on your award. Um, there is also a five band award for working Unfortunately, the traditional five bands, you can see that I have five bands, but I don't have the right ones to get the five band award yet. You have to get 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. And I'm missing um, 15 and 10 for worked all states. On uh, 15, I have 49 states with uh, uh, West Virginia missing. It usually it's one of those nearby ones on a high band that likes to skip that uh, people have trouble with. So uh, um, I'm thinking maybe I'll be able to get that to 50 this year. Uh, this is what the uh, DXCC award looks like. And unlike WAS with DXCC, you get separate pieces of paper for a mode, in this case digital, or for a band. So there's a 40 meter, an 80 meter, and so on. Uh, there's also a, a five band uh, DXCC. And it, again, it's the same five bands that I mentioned before. Um, I have four of those. I don't have 10 meter DXCC yet. Um, on this one, I showed it to you because I've got a couple endorsement stickers. So you get the paper awards when you get 100 confirmed and verified entities. And then there's an endorsement for uh, in increments of 50 for a while. And then as it gets up higher, I think the uh, uh, number that you have to get for the next increment goes down. So those are paper awards. Uh, here's a more difficult award that actually comes as a nice looking plaque. Uh, this is the DXCG challenge award and finishing this up was my project. Well, last year I thought it was going to be my project for 2019 and 2020, but I actually finished it in October of uh, 2019. At the start of 2019, I needed uh, 120 points or so, and I didn't know how long it would take to get those, but it turned out last year was a really good year for D expeditions. Uh, so what do you do to get the challenge award? It requires a thousand contacts and the, the combination of DXCC entity and band has to be unique. Um, and a way to run up your points is to work the D expeditions because they hop around bands. And so each time you get this, you get a new entity on uh, several different bands, then you get uh, several points through your uh, DXCC challenge award. Um, and then there are endorsements for 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, and 3,000. And since it's taken me uh, 10 years to get to 1,000, um, it'll be a long time, I think, before I get any of those endorsements. Uh, and of course, it doesn't get any easier to find a new DXCC as time goes on. Okay, so there, there are some of the uh, awards. Uh, why chase them? Well, uh, for me, there's an excitement. You know, I, there's more adrenaline that flows when uh, there, I hear somebody who's going to get me uh, 
some points to whatever award or awards I don't have and I'm working on. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of folks like to keep track of milestones. You know, have you worked all the states? Uh, how many DXCC entities have you worked, uh, regardless of whether they go for awards? Um, I like to put stuff up on my wall, so as those who come to my shack know. And uh, also, you pay fees to the ARRL or other sponsor, and uh, it's a way of supporting the ARRL. So that's why I chase awards. But of course, you know, it's it's your hobby. It's up to you. There's no, uh, you know, odd or must in award chasing. It's whatever you want to do. Okay, so what do you have to do? Well, each award has a set of rules about what contacts are required. So you have, of course, to make those. And you need a confirmation from the partner stations, um, QSL card or one of the electronic systems. And again, depending on uh, who's issuing the award, uh, uh, which ones of those are acceptable. Um, Paper cards have to be verified typically with an ARL card checker. And for us, Terry Hines fulfills that function and uh, does a great job and makes it all very easy for you. And then you have to submit an application and pay the associated fees. And the fees depend on how you submit the application and uh, you know what the award is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so let's talk about uh, some tools for helping you uh, keep track of your contacts primarily. Uh, if you're interested in the ARL awards, uh, using ARL's logbook of the world for confirmations is really a big plus because uh, that any confirmation that's in logbook of the world does not have to be verified further except that you have to pay a fee to uh, use the uh, logbook of the world entry for an award. Uh, that's how they, they uh, fund the logbook of the world. So creating an account, uploading to the account, that's all free. And then when you want to apply the uh, uh, QSOs towards an award, uh, there's, there's a fee for that. Um, and the, they do it that way because after all, you know, if, Bill Mims goes out and works 3,000 stations uh, from Galapagos Island. You don't want to bill uh, uh, Bill Mims for um, 3,000 entries in Logbook of the World. You want those to go in and you want to collect from the people who want to use those uh, confirmations for their awards. Um, so uh, Logbook of the World, a good thing. Um, a club log account. Um, for uh, many D expeditions, uh, like to get their requests for a paper QSL or or maybe for a logbook of the world QSL uh, by asking you to pay a fee and confirming the contact. They upload their log to club log, and um, then. Um, you can get onto club log and put in your contact details and it handles the fee and it gives the uh, DX station uh, all the information they need. It verifies the contact and it uh, prints out, it uh, formats and gets ready the labels that they're going to print out and paste on your QSL card. So for the DX station's perspective, that's a lot easier than getting an envelope in the mail with $2 or whatever, and an envelope uh, uh, that has to be kept track of. Um, if it goes through club log, all of that is automated. Okay, logging software. Um, I think both log for old man, log for OM, and the DX Lab DX Keeper are good products for tracking awards. And as an exercise, I've been using DX Keeper. I um, put my log up on log for OEM and gave that a run. And uh, I had heard that uh, some people like that better. 
And after trying both, I would say that depending on your circumstances, um, you might pick one or the other based on features that are only in one of the two. So at this point, um, one of the features in, in the DX Lab suite that I think is compelling is that it has the ability to let you hook up to multiple clusters. It will consolidate those. It will bounce those against your log. And if you want it to, it will email you when a station that you need for, uh, for an award that you're working on is spotted. Um, so you don't have to have your rig running or uh, be checking your email or where well, you have to check your email or but you don't have to uh, uh, be looking at a website or whatever, looking at the spots, it will email you when a spot of interest comes in. I didn't see that in log for OM. On the other hand, I think that the way log for OM um, handles tracking of awards is nicer and makes it easier for me to find the information that I want to find in order to uh, know what I've got confirmed and go after the ones that uh, aren't confirmed. Um, both of them allow you to automatically upload and download from, download from Logbook of the World, and they both track both electronic and paper QSLs and provide progress reports. Um, I, th I like the ones from Log for OM better than the ones from DX Lab. And actually, let me tell you what, let, uh, let me share um, now the uh, report from Log for OM. So let me bring that window up. So up here, I can pick the award that I want uh, it to tell me a story about, which um, is, well, this is better than what I got in DX Keeper because there are a lot more awards, plus a uh, log for OM lets you configure a new award and tell it a story about, you know, what the criteria are. So I'm going to pick DXCC first of all. And there are a couple of views. This one lists the DXCC entity. And uh, I, the V stands for uh, verified, that is, I've got a contact that's you know, ready to be submitted. And GRA is granted. And I'm not sure exactly how these get set, because a lot of these really are granted at this point. Uh, but the thing I like about this is down here, um, I've got uh, Anguilla on 80 meters that says W, which has worked. If I click on that, um, it takes me to my log and it has popped up a window with the log entry. Um, I imagine you can't see the pop up right now, but uh, uh, that's a lot easier. A DX keeper has uh, a report like this, but it comes on paper and you have to do searches to find, you know, the uh, entry for the workstation in your log and then uh, drill into it. So this is an interesting view. And you notice, you know, the uh, uh, DXCC numbers go up to 522, even though there are only 340 of them. And that's because of uh, the geopolitical changes uh, causing entities to appear and disappear. Um, if I uh, click on statistics, then I can see by band that uh, for DXCCs, I've on 80 meters, I've worked 129, I've confirmed 125, and 125 have been validated. That is, I've done all the things necessary to uh, submit those for awards. And you see those for this is total, and then it breaks out CW and digital and phone, which I uh, don't work very much. And similarly, if I change from DXCC um, to worked all states, I get the same kind of. Um, 
uh, views. Here's the uh, statistics view. And if I go to the award view, then I can scroll down and see on 10 meters, gee, what do I need? Well, it looks like I don't have Alaska and I don't have Delaware and so on. And I told you on 15 meters, I was missing one. I, I can scroll down and easily see that the one is West Virginia. And, uh, you know, quickly uh, analyze my, my logbook and find out what it is that I have and what it is that I need. Okay, let me tell you what, while we're talking about stuff, um, let me also tell you a, a little bit about uh, Club Log. I mentioned that as a source for electronic um, requests for QSLs. And I thought I would show you something um, on my Club Log account about some things, some nice things that I saw that it does. So let me get logged into it here. And so uh, share this. So as another exercise in, in putting this presentation together, I decided to upload my log to Club Log and see what it could do for me. And actually something pretty interesting. Um, you know, it, it has a DXCC chart that is similar to uh, the report that I showed you in uh, log for oem telling me which entities I have and whether they're worked or confirmed or whatever. Um, but uh, it also has this thing, um, now let's see, the QSL chart, which I thought was pretty neat because of this is again DXCC focused and it tells me who I've worked and confirmed. But as I scroll down, let's take a look at Ivory Coast. At this point, Ivory Coast has been worked but not confirmed. However, it's telling me that the Ivory Coast station, TU5PCT, has uploaded his log there is a matching entry between his log and my log and uh, a TU5PCT uh, subscribes to the OQRS, that is the online QSL request system in Club Log. And by the way, there's more than one OQRS system. Club Log is the most popular. Uh, there are um, QSL managers that have their own system for this. And also, uh, individual hams uh, who are DX sometimes on their QRZ page will be will, will have a post saying, "Hey, I don't need your QSL. Uh, please go to PayPal and send me three dollars or whatever it is for postage, and include the QSO details, and I'll respond with the QSL card." So that's another way that you sometimes can get electronic uh, QSLs. Okay, well, let me click on OQRS. And this is what the OQRS page looks like. Um, if you just follow a link that you might find on uh, TU5PCT's website, it'll take you here and you have to fill in the month, day, and hour, or your call sign first, and then the month, day, and hour and minutes of the QSO, and it tries to match. And then you say, whether you want a direct or a bureau card, um, I can click direct. And if I check out, it'll take me to PayPal and I will pay the uh, 3.96 euros through PayPal. And uh, the request will go to uh, TU5PCT uh, for the QSL card. So, um, you know, that. Uh, Finding where there's an opportunity to do that in your log is, I thought, a nice feature of Club Log. Okay, so I've done this stuff with you. Um, and pardon me for going into this really granular level of detail, but I thought there's something I would uh, tell folks about El Logbook of the World and uh, the award tracking in ARL. It turns out that uh, your account for award points and your logbook of the world count, uh, count start as separate entities and you have to link them. 
And I didn't think that this is explained at all clearly or well on the ARL website. Uh, so if you are new and if you are just getting started setting up, there's a one-time setup step that you had to do, and this is the link for it. Okay, so enough about record keeping. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about making contacts. I think these are um, potential ways of doing it. So casual contacts, of course, and if you're just getting started, a good way to start is just uh, getting confirmations for the contacts you are making uh, anyway when you work casually. Um, and I've mentioned, I've already mentioned the DX Lab suite uh, has the ability to help out with spots by emailing you when they show up. That's kind of a neat feature. Um, one day I was at a club meeting lamenting the difficulty of working Delaware. And uh, John Riggy said, you know, what you're not doing is Sunday driving the contest. If you do that, you'll get Delaware. Um, so by Sunday drive, we mean, hey, not everybody who joins the contest and participates expects to win. Um, some people just are there to see who they can work and enjoy the contest. Maybe they work it for two hours on a two-day contest. Um, so uh, that's, that's often a very good source of DXCCs that you don't have um, because there are a, a number of stations that will get set up just for the contest in uh, the more unusual DXCCs. And so getting some new ones um, often is a possibility. And also not just during the contest period because they've gone to someplace new to set up. Well, they wanna test their station. So just before and maybe just after the contest, there will be DX stations that are uh, there because of the contest on the air, you know, making contacts. So that's another good way to find them. Um, last year, as I mentioned, was a really good uh, year for D expeditions. There were just a ton of them. Um, also, something that is a relatively recent development is the so-called FT8 Foxhound mode. And I have some slides on that in a moment. Um, another approach for work all states, of course, is the state QSO parties. So uh, I've noted for myself that uh, West Virginia's QSO party is June 20th. I need it on 15 meters and, uh, you know, maybe in summer there'll be some sporadic E on 15 or uh, maybe we'll have sunspots by then and I'll be able to get a West Virginia station. Uh, uh, do I have a question from someone? I think someone was, was laughing at your hopeful thinking. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. Well, I you do got a real. West, I, I do hear West Virginia stations from time to time. Well, you know something, uh, Doug? A bit, a bit of a side story. Back when we had a, a field day, we had a 10 meter sporadic E opening where I was hearing. Uh, four, 10 meters like it was 40 meters. There was Delaware and um, Connecticut and everything all on 10 meters because it was all sporadic E. <laughs> yeah, and sporadic E is lower than uh, um, the more typical modes of propagation on the higher bands. So that means that you're more likely to be able to work the closer stations because the skips won't be as long. So um, we'll see what happens, but summer is a good time to look for sporadic E. Okay, um, FT8. Um, for those of you who have pan adapter radios, this is my pan adapter. And when you work FT8, you tune to a standard watering hole. And 7074, which you see over towards the right, uh, is the standard watering hole for FT8. And 7048, which you see you know, over on the left, you see some signals. That's the FT4 watering hole. But hey, what's this? It's 705, 
six or seven or something. You see a bunch of signals rising and falling all together. Uh, that's the characteristic signature of FT8 signals outside the regular watering hole. All right, what that typically means is that there's a DX station or some other station who uh, anticipates generating a pileup working outside of the regular FT8 watering hole frequency and obviously attracting some attention. Now, another thing you'll see if, if it's a fox hound thing is the the uh, fox, that is the station, the DX station, is transmitting on alternate periods. So you'll see one period that looks like that with a zillion callers, and then you'll see one period where there's only uh, a little bit of activity from the, from the fox, and then another uh, uh, display that looks like this. Well, I saw this um, a week ago, and it turned out that it was for U1 UN, the UN headquarters uh, working the Fox Hound mode. Uh, but if you have a pan adapter radio, which I do, and uh, on my radio, I can run four of these guys at once. So I can easily uh, take a look at the band and see what's going on. And if there's uh, a Fox Hound thing happening, uh, it's, it's easy to spot. Uh, for those of you who have worked FT8 but not Foxhound, well, let me first of all uh, show you what uh, what it looks like in the FT8 software. Um, now it turned out that I could hear 4U1 UN, but I could hear almost nobody who was calling him um, when I was on. So I just saw alternate. Um, periods with this heavy signal under 500 hertz. And then, um, uh, or one or more signals, and then not much, because for some reason, you know, the propagation was such that who, uh, whoever was calling him wasn't, uh, uh, you know, wasn't coming through at the time. Uh, you notice there's one, two, and then three signals over here on the left. The fox can transmit to multiple stations at the same time. And you see that um, down here in the band activity window. Uh, look at the one with the, um, uh, the bottom three lines. Um, let's see, this is a different station. This is VP5D. Uh, VP5D called CQ and uh, said 73 to two other stations in the latest time period. So he was transmitting three signals. Uh, FT8 Foxhound is the easiest way to uh, try to uh, get through a, a pileup because it's all automated. All you do is take a look at uh, the uh, uh, other signals in the period where the uh, Hounds are transmitting, try to find an open frequency, click on that frequency, press the enable TX button, and sit back and wait for it to happen. Uh, it will automatically call CQ until the fox answers. And then when the fox answers, what it does is automatically change your transmit frequency to the frequency that the fox called you on um, for you to answer. And then the fox sends Roger Roger 73, and that's the end of the contact. It's all automated on your end. You just uh, pick a frequency, sit back, and see if it happens. If it doesn't happen, maybe you pick another frequency and try again. And if it still doesn't happen, well, maybe it's just not your night. You need to uh, see if you see the fox uh, at another time. Now, the fox, on the other hand, is also automated. He's just hearing stations and uh, telling the software, okay, go ahead and work, um, you know, AK4AO in my case. And then AK4 works, goes in the queue, and when the software can get around to it, it's worked through the other stations ahead, it'll call AK4AO and try to complete a queue cell. Um, and all the fox has to do is uh, 
you know, sit back and add things to the queue as they come in. So um, it's much, much different. There's no strategy of like you have in CW of trying to figure out where the uh, DX station is tuning and where you want to transmit on and so on. Um, but that, that just doesn't uh, come into play here. Um, just briefly, how to work in, in the software, because it's a little different from regular FT8. Uh, first thing is, can you hear the fox? And sometimes you can only hear the hounds. Well, then it's not your night, of course. Uh, you have to put the software in the fox hound mode and tell it that you're a hound. And then the fox calls always up below 500 hertz, or sometimes they go a little bit above, uh, but below 1K. Hounds pick a frequency above 1K that looks like it's open and push the go button and that's it. Uh, and hope that uh, the fox will call you and the software will exchange the uh, signal report and, and you'll hear a 73. So a very easy mode. I worked almost only the uh, uh, FT8 uh, to get my 120 for the DXCC challenge last year. Um, okay, well, let's talk a little bit um, about confirming. Uh, I don't want to go through the process of sending paper QSLs and getting the response back because we've talked about that. And I put up this slide because uh, some of you are new to the club and you may not know about this page on our website, but I wanted to point it out to you. So this is uh, a screenshot of the VWS website. Um, and what I've done is at the top menu, I've gone to meetings and then you pull that down and there's a choice for presentations. So you go there and you get a page like this and there's a search box, uh, which um, is pointed to by the red arrow on the right. And in this particular case, I've uh, searched for QSL and I've uh, found all the presentations on, uh, uh, that have the word QSL in them. I could uh, search for Heinz, I could search for N4ZH, and I would get uh, pretty much the same list except for the one I did in 2016 on QSLing. So if you are new to getting paper QSLs and want to know the ropes, um, you know, there's the live stream and the slides. I recommend Terry's presentation in 2019 for some more information on that. And I've already shown you the OQRS and club log. I think the one thing that's changed in the last few years is that there's been a really big uptake uh, of the online QSL uh, request systems and a lot of the de-expeditions in particular are really would prefer you go that way to uh, get your QSL. Um, if you've got paper cards, um, there is a best way to submit the paper cards. And uh, if you have DX Keeper um, and you get a new DXCC entity and you've told it you're working on DXCC, uh, when you download from Logbook of the World, it will say you've got a new one and it'll say, send this card to the ARL DXCC desk. Well, that'll work. That's the worst way. All right, the best way is to go to the online application at the URL that's here and what you do is provide a list of the paper cards to be checked and the details. And you can do that either by typing it in or you can also, uh, if your uh, log makes it easy to create an ADIF file of the cards that you want to submit, you can do that, you can upload that. And then you get your application together, you take a printed copy of that to Terry, he checks the cards, uh, you also give him a stamped envelope and he signs the uh, um, application and sends it 
to ARL and all they have to do is say, yep, no deletions, okay, and push the button and, and uh, all of those are confirmed. So uh, that's going to be a lot cheaper and a lot uh, faster process than uh, bundling up your cards and sending them to ARL and eventually getting through the queue to be checked and having them uh, charge you a lot for a very uh, secure, trackable means of shipping the cards back to you. Okay, well that's what I have in slides. Uh, so let me uh, pause here and see what questions you guys have. I see uh, something on the chat. Um, uh, this is from Kevin, WB0POH. He says, the ARL DX contest is my favorite contest, and most of my DX QSOs come from there. Yeah, I mean, what's a better deal than a contest where you can only work DX stations, and there are a zillion DX stations there waiting to work you? I mean, it's great. OK, what other comments or questions do you have? Okay, I see Mike at E4R raising his hand. Yeah, you, you'll need to okay. unmute. Okay, I, I think I just did. You did? Um, I, uh, I couldn't get Delaware in 2013. Tried and tried and tried. And then um, I hit on the idea of looking for a Delaware traffic net. And uh, sure enough, there is one. And I, um, they called for check-ins, and I checked in, and a couple of guys uh, met me after the net and on CW, and both of them sent me QSL cards. So that was a way to do it. All right. So, so maybe that's your West Virginia on 15 meters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good luck. Okay. Well, I hear West Virginia every now and then, so sooner or later it's going to happen. And propagation, well, we're at solar minimum now, so there isn't anything worse than that. It'll only get better. Uh, let's see, I think KA4CDN had a comment. I found when I was doing my card submission the first time, there was a really complicated step where you have to link your submitted paper cards to your logbook of the world account. The yes. cards don't show up automatically. And, and that was very confusing. That was one of the most confusing parts. I finally called and the lady just did it for me. But there's some magical step in there that I could not figure out. Yeah, and that it, I had a slide on that step. That's the slide where I talked about uh, a URL of linking your um, logbook of the world and DXCC accounts. It is very confusing. It is not at all well explained on the website. And that's why I put that slide in there because it's a one-time step, but it's, uh, you really feel lost in the woods until you find out about it. Yeah, it's Tim. Uh, if you worked a country that was on the DX list, but not anymore, and you worked it when it was, will it still count? I believe the answer is no. Once it's become a deleted entity, you can't use it. Okay, thanks. Actually, um, I don't know when that happened, Doug, but I think a few of my countries were deleted and they did count. Okay. Uh, Yugoslavia, for example, was considered a separate country on my uh, DXCC list, which kind of surprised me. And um, that's, I think there's a couple other ones that I ran into. I'll, I'll check my list, but I think some of mine were, in fact, they were worked during when they, like, like Tim said, they were worked when they were, uh, when they were like Netherlands and Tilly's, but then they split that up. But Charlie, I worked, I worked Netherlands and Tilly's while it was still Netherlands and Tilly's. And then I worked another one of Antigua or something like that. And they both count as separate countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought they didn't count, but I could be wrong on that. Because yeah, I've got some old uh, logs that list some of the countries that have been switched around a bit and I was just wondering if I could keep them. Yeah, okay, we'll have to confirm that for sure. Doug, uh, just quickly, I just thought I'd like to say thank you. That was a great presentation. And uh, you you mentioned this in passing, but I just want to reinforce it. In case everybody's wondering, 
the expeditions don't want your card. They don't have anything, they don't have any place for it and they don't want it. So the OQRS system is really a good way to go. Club log is a great help. Yeah, Bill, mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping to do the same thing because one of the one, one country I have been, I know him in his log, but I've never sent a car because I'm afraid to lose money on it is uh, an RI1 ANT. That Russian Antarctica station I've worked on five watts. I have, I, I'm in his log, but I've never sent the car off because if I do, I'm worried it's, I'm going to send it off five or six times because my $5 bill is going to go away. It might get stolen. <laughs> Yeah, certainly one problem that uh, comes up is that uh, in some countries, the postal workers are not necessarily that honest. And uh, when they find out that um, a certain addressee is getting dollar bills and, and envelopes, you know, the dollar bills start to disappear. But yes, uh, Bill, I got a taste of that because I was the QSL manager when we did a special event station and, uh, you know, had the postman coming to me with a tub full of of uh, cards. So yeah, if you multiply that by several hundred times, um, I think that uh, that would be a, an overwhelming amount of, uh, of work to deal with a bunch of paper cards. All righty, thank you, Doug. Um, excellent. A lot about uh, chasing the awards there. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, I, I think, uh, that's about all we have on the program for this evening.